try not to be irritated. Amen. Y'all say a prayer. Amen. All right, we are going to uh, spend a few moments in the Word of God uh, talking and continuing this theme on stand. How do we stand with uh, our, 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 our women and girls, uh, those who find themselves uh, dealing with all kinds of various struggles? And again, uh, we do have some open seats, so you that are in the overflow, if you want to kind of make your way into the sanctuary and grab one of these open seats, certainly feel free to do so. Uh, but uh, we want to do everything that we can to, amen, let's see if a better mic. Check one, two. Check one, two, check one, two. Check one, two. Check one, two. Lord, help me. Check one, two. It's the purple mic. Check one, two, check, 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 check one, two, check one, two. So I think the gains on this mic is just way too high. So maybe turn the gains down on, on the yellow mic. <laughs> Amen. All right. John chapter number 8, verse number 1, is where we're going to spend our time today. And uh, we are continuing on this <clears throat> Lighten Your Load series, uh, but we are going to be focusing specifically today on this topic of how do we stand with our black women and girls, particularly, but I will certainly say, how do we stand with women and girls in general? Uh, I, I, I would like to say a couple of framing uh, doc, uh, conversations or at least ideas because I do know that our congregation, though it is uh, evidently or uh, particularly a, a, a predominantly black congregation, I do love the growing uh, diversity, racial diversity, economic diversity, all of the diversity that's in our congregation. Um, and, and part of what I, I am appreciating even about this moment of liberation in our country and even in the world is that you are finding people, no matter what background they are from, really starting to see that there are very, very uh, tragic uh, contradictions that our society and our world um, are operating under. And often uh, the issue of exploitation and the issue of degradation and violence towards the other is something that is becoming increasingly uh, uh, kind of implicitly and explicitly affirmed by all kinds of forces in the world, whether they are presidential candidates, whether they are uh, uh, political leaders, whether they are uh, media outlets and all kinds of different things that for many of us, uh, if you are uh, not fitting a category that is quite narrow, how many of you know you can often find yourself pretty feeling vulnerable at times? So when we think of uh, the, the role that particularly black faith, black Christian faith has played in the United States of America, it has been a subversive effort, an expression of God's revelation in the world. It has been a subversive kind of uh, catalyst of God's love in the world to make sure that whiteness, not necessarily white people, but whiteness, the racial hierarchy that would say that everything that is perfect, everything that is good, everything that is wealthy, everything that is powerful, then that, that is found in whiteness, a destination that leads to nowhere. And uh, part of what black Christian faith in particular has been able to do is subvert that and de demonstrate that God is active everywhere with whosoever is open and willing to have a relationship with this almighty God. You ought to thank God for that, amen? You ought to thank God for that. So as, as black liberation thoughts began to become much more pronounced, black became not just a description of one's race or phenotype or a measure of the melanin in one's skin, but black also became a description about a political posture towards the forces of oppression uh, in the world. 
Are you following me? Uh, that James Cone, the father of black theology, who also helped inspire liberation theology that took off in Central America and that helped to lead and inspire many of the revolts against the oppressive regimes there, they understood that to be black was not just about being dark, it was about standing against the systems of oppression that cause any suffering or human exploitation to happen under the name of God or any other name in the world. So as we talk about standing with black women and girls, I want you to imagine this to be a double entendre, if you will, have a double meaning that, of course, we want to certainly acknowledge the unique challenges that our black women and girls face, but also appreciate that to be black is not just to have some dark skin. But to be black is to resist oppression anywhere it finds itself. And in that case, all of us in here should be black. I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell them, you got to be black today. You got to be black today. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, that was just a short synopsis. If you was in my theology class, I'd have messed all y'all up, praise God. But, but I, I do hope it helps you to locate yourself in this conversation, amen? Because how many of you know an affirmation is not the same as a negation? Uh, that we can affirm that the lives of our loved ones matter without negating the lives of anyone else. And uh, to all my loved ones in here, I welcome your input and uh, slide us some notes and some emails and help us figure out how we could more uniquely stand with you in your own particular cultural experience over and against the forces of oppression and degradation in this society. Uh, some of us are, 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 are totally aware of the, the, the resistance happening in the Dakotas this past week. And uh, actually one of our members, Brother Patrick, I don't know if he's here, but he has family up there. So some of us may be taking a trip up to the Dakotas, amen, and to stand with our native brothers and sisters, amen. Many of us know, of course, that our, our, our brown brothers and sisters and our Asian brothers and sisters, and even some of our white brothers and sisters, particularly our poor white brothers and sisters, folks are catching a whole lot of trouble in the world. And I believe if anybody ought to stand up, it better be the church. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How can we stand up? Okay, here we go. We're going to John chapter number 8. We're going to read the first 11 verses to give us a little bit of a background. And uh, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible since we already heard some good preaching from our panel. Uh, so if y'all say amen, this may be the shortest sermon you've ever heard in your life. Mm -hmm. If you can give me a little bit more monitors, a little bit more monitors, a little bit more monitors if you can. If you can't, then I'll just make it so. Uh, verse number one, Jesus went across to Mount Olives, and I'm reading, I believe, from the, from the message translation. Is that right? Yep. Jesus went uh, across to Mount Olives, but he was soon back in the temple again. Never let it be said that Jesus didn't go to church. Amen. Swarms of people came to Jesus, sat, and Jesus sat down and taught them. Then the religious scholars and Pharisees, think about this, he has some church folk and Pharisees who were often the political elite class of the Jewish uh, Israeli or I Israelite uh, community that were in cahoots with the Roman Empire. All right. So you got religious folk and you got political folk in cahoots. Lord have mercy. They led a woman who had been caught in an act of adultery into Jesus and they stood her in plain sight of everyone and said, teacher, this woman has was caught red-handed in the act of adultery. Moses in the law gives orders to stone such persons. What do you say? They were trying to trap Jesus into saying something incriminating so they could bring charges against Jesus. <coughs> Jesus bent down, wrote with his finger in the dirt. They kept at Jesus, badgering him. He straightened up and said, the sinless one among you, go first, throw the stone. Bending down again, Jesus wrote some more in the dirt. Hearing that, they walked away, one after another, beginning with the oldest. The woman was left alone. Jesus stood up and spoke to her. Woman, where are your accusers? Does no one condemn you? No one, master. 
Jesus said, neither do I. Go on your way. From now on, don't sin. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So I'm going to speak from the topic simply, stand up. Stand up. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will bless the word of God, which has been read for us, the people of God. I ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, just stand up. Just stand up. Now, it's very important to appreciate a couple of things in this passage that are of significance. You know, when I was prayerfully considering what passage to to preach, you know, because I know we're getting ready to do this great big series, I'm I'm pretty cool, you know, not feeling like this is the only time I'm going to be able to have a chance to talk, uh, particularly about the powerful expressions of womanhood and, 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 and women's uh, voices and leadership in the text, because I was over talking about Deborah, and I was, I was in, in some passages where, you know, there were some super big champions about the kind of work that's getting ready to happen. Uh, but I, I, I thought that this passage would be particularly interesting and important to speak about, uh, not because uh, women are certainly uh, reduced to uh, these kinds of 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 social uh, conditions and or behaviors in the text, meaning that, you know, sometimes we can we can pull out some text and, 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 and just like many of us can have a story be told about us. And often the story is often told about us that we are the problem. Amen. That the problem is with us. And clearly this woman being caught in adultery one could make a very terrible conclusion that the problem is with her and her behavior. But I felt compelled to stay in this passage because I thought that it may actually uh, get us a little bit closer to what I think we are being called to do if we're going to stand up. That you and I don't get to pick and choose who we stand up for. If we're going to stand up for uh, folk, we got to stand up for them even when they may find themselves in a problematic situation. And one may even argue uh, that there is certainly a particular kind of opportunity for uh, us to do our own self-checking. I, I liked, I can't remember which one of the brilliant sisters on the panel said that it gives us an opportunity to, to take a little look in the mirror ourselves and ask ourselves some questions about why is it that I'm only able to stand up for the perfect victim as if there is such a thing. It causes me, at least, to start to ask my own, myself some different questions about what we're calling now respectability politics. This idea that if you are not respectable, then you uh, deserve whatever comes your way. But how many of you know that uh, if Jesus uh, dealt with us on a respectable political frame, there'd be very few of us. I know there's a few of you in here who are really sanctified. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> There's a couple of you in here. But how many know a very few of us would actually make it through? On to the other side. The rest of us, we'd be sitting there like, well, you know, Jesus, the spirit is willing. Oh, but this old flesh. Uh-huh. That part of this process of standing up is to free our own selves of the kind of mental chains, psychological chains, spiritual chains that would keep you in your seat when you see obvious injustice happening even to those who do not fit our perfect victim description. You see, part of what's at the root of this to me, theologically and certainly we who follow the ways of Jesus, is that we must make sure that we take what God said in Scripture seriously, that when God created the world, God created everything, and it was good. Everything God created was good. 
And when you take seriously the scriptural text that talks about that we have all been created in the image of God, not just men and not just wealthy men and not just wealthy elite men and not just wealthy elite white men, but all of us and all of our difference have been created in the image of God. That in many respects, you and I are like God's thumbprint in the world. You know, when you get ready to, to you know, uh, try to do some crime, you know, you ought to try to leave as little bit of evidence. I'm not giving you no action steps. I'm just speaking hy hyperbolically. Or no, hypothetically. Sorry, Sharice. Hey, man, she be, she be trying to coach me at home on the GRE words, but it's just too many of them. But you know, the, the, the good thief or the, 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 the effective thief would put on gloves to make sure what? They don't leave any prints behind. So they can be in and out of there without a whole lot of evidence. But how many of you know when God created you, God didn't use any gloves? Because God thought you were so good, he wanted to leave a lot of evidence Woo, behind of the image of God he placed inside of us that makes us good. And one of the first things you ought to tell yourself when you wake up in the morning is, look at God, I am good. I am good. Because this world will try to make you feel like you are not good. The world will always try to remind you of your deficiencies your idiosyncrasies, your weaknesses, your dispositions. But how many of you know, even with all of that you may have, when God looks at you, God smiles and says, that is good. And I'm here to tell you, if God says you good, <laughs> you all right. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. You ought to give your neighbor a quick high five and tell them if God says I'm good then I am all right. I am all right. And, and, and it is this kind of, of particular assumption that we must take seriously. Why? Because in the world, particularly when we start talking about black women and girls and all the different ways in which uh, we are seeing the experience of suffering happening to our sisters, there is a lot of victimization and exploitation that is happening as a result of patriarchy. This idea that, that all power and value and worth and, and dignity and expertise and, and goodness is essentialized in maleness. And if you fall outside the bounds of maleness, even the, the, the definition of maleness is often contextual. Man, depending on what country you in, what, what part of the, I mean, I, uh, yeah, what country you in, you know, uh, we're going to talk about masculinity and maleness uh, pretty soon, but, but in, in, our, in our series, but how many know it, it looks different in different places? And it looks different across time. <laughs> I wish I could talk to somebody. I, I was looking at the old, the old uh, 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 costumes and outfits of the early rap artists. And I was just thinking in my mind, what would it look like if, <laughs> if you know, some of them early <clears throat> folk in the hip hop era showed up today? I mean, can you imagine Rick Ross, amen, and some of them, them glistening, half tight short pants and and, you know, red, green hair, and, and you know, some of us be like, man, Rick Ross, Rick Ross, you know, his, his, his appearance does not match his material. <laughs> Amen. Because often in some of our, our, our commercialized mainstream forms of hip-hop, how do we know that there has been such a, a, a narrow description of masculinity, Right? that it often is dependent upon aggression and force over others and even over the vulnerable. So, so we have to appreciate that patriarchy is, is, is not something that, that is a fixed 
uh, uh, kind of uh, description as it relates to how one understands maleness or masculinity. But patriarchy is also about a system of beliefs that try to use force and use coercion to try and make people fit into some kind of predetermined box that God did not create for you to fit into. And when we see the many ways that uh, black women are finding themselves impacted by violence, both violence physically, emotionally, psychologically. Part of why I thought it was important for us to do this liturgy was and call out some of these names was because of the various forms that violence uh, are perpetrated against our women. We said the name of Sandra Bland. Many of us know that she was victimized by the police and and something uh, uh, happened in her case where she was definitely taken beyond the point of reasonable force and left and abandoned and no one no seems to know what happened in the jail. No one except for us who've been there before, amen, and realized that her life was taken, victimized by the state. Rajon A. Jeffries, a young sister who was killed in downtown Oakland uh, during a shootout of some young uh, men we presuppose or we suppose uh, who were angry about a conflict and she just performed a praise dance at the funeral of some other friends who had died uh, in a drowning and as she's walking to her car she's struck by bullets in a crossfire intracommunal violence Corrine Gaines we know uh, this sister in Baltimore who was uh, being harassed continuously by the police and, and, and she was uh, in such a place of despair and anger and frustration that the police were coming to her home to try and uh, harass her and serve her with some kind of warrant. And she resisted even to death. And was killed and shot up by the police, even with her son in her lap. Because she had a weapon and a pistol in her possession. Joy Qway, a woman who was beat by her boyfriend, chained to a bench and was beaten to death while one of his friends watched in a public space in a park. Intimate partner violence. Sky Mokabe, a trans woman who was killed in suspicious in, uh, circumstances Many believe because of the role and presence of transphobia in the world. All these different forms of violence that come against black women in the world, and yet there is not a deafening silence, but a silence too often. To name this evil and affirm the goodness that is inherent in the bodies and the soul and the spirit and the mind of our women who are, in many respects, the canal of life to the world. God has a message for you, my sisters, and even for all of us in this room, that there is a, 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 a call for not only us to stand up with you, but for you to continue to stand for yourself. That even in your moments of vulnerability and even in your moments of difficulty, Jesus shows us in this text that whatever state you may find yourself in, whenever state you may find yourself in, you will always have someone to stand up with you and for you because the goodness of who you are is never erased by the circumstances you find yourself in. Mm -hmm. Here in the text, we see that there are all kinds of things uh, that you and I can do and imagine if we are going to stand up with our sisters. The first thing that I find so interesting about this passage is that Jesus is very much uh, dealing with his ministry in the temple, and yet he is approached by these religious and political leaders who are always trying to discredit the work and the ministry of Jesus' liberation efforts in his community. And Jesus being in the temple reminds me that you and I should never 
uh, 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 miss out an opportunity to do our work in the house of God, through the house of God, meeting in the house of God. Why? Because it is here you and I can get a little bit of extra support and clarity around who and what God is calling us to do. In the particular passage that we want to uh, lift up first, I am so appreciative that Jesus, first off, is calling you and I to make sure that in these times of difficulty, listen, how do we not abandon one another? That's the first question I want you to wrestle with today. If we're going to stand up for our black women and girls, how do we not abandon them in their points of need? Somebody say, do not abandon the scripture is so important in this particular way because we see in the text that when the accusations and the accusers come, Jesus does not abandon the woman, but the scripture says he kneels down in the dirt and he starts to do a little bit of writing. I don't know if I could use my Holy Ghost imagination what Jesus was doing, why he decided to kneel down in the dirt, but I can think of at least two things. One of the things I can imagine is that since Jesus was there at the beginning where he actually uh, participated in the creation of human uh, uh, soul and body, the scripture says that he fashioned humanity out of the dust of the ground. And then he blew into human beings the breath of life. Could it be that Jesus said, you know what? In this moment where someone is trying to diminish your humanity, let me get a little closer to the origin of their humanity. Because Jesus remembered he was there. Jesus remembered what it was like when you were and we were and I was in our lowest form. Before we were considered to be something worthy of love and protection and solidarity, Jesus is reminding himself and maybe even reminding you that if you're going to stand, you got to be willing to get in the dirt. Get closer to the origins and the deepest struggles of what it means to be human. While we were in Milwaukee, I was so moved by one of these young brothers who spoke at the funeral and he was admonishing the congregation who were filled with uh, 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 sorrow over the death of Brother Seville Smith. And he, he said so powerfully, he said, it is our job as people of faith to find the gems and the diamonds and the gold that is often buried in the dirt. You see, sometimes many of us, we don't appreciate that before that, that precious gem makes it to the store for you to buy it, somebody had to dig real deep to uncover the, the preciousness, the value that was buried in the dirt. Could it be that Jesus realized that in order for me to stand with this woman, I need to get in closer proximity to where she is socially being located at her lowest point. Some of us have to make a commitment not to abandon one another when we find ourselves at our lowest points. When you're in your point of depression, it's not time for you to hit the eject button. When your sister is struggling with her greatest bout of insecurity or violation or abuse. How many know she needs you more now than ever to kneel down in the dirt and, and, and spend time with her? Not wait for her to get herself together. Well, I'll wait for you to come on through that. No, no, no. If Jesus, now trip, and I remember when I talk about Jesus, I'm not talking about the pale skin Blonde hair, blue eyes, Michelangelo look-alike with a bad perm. That's not the Jesus I'm talking about. When I talk about Jesus, I'm talking about the dark-skinned Palestinian Jew who was born to a teenage unwed mother in the hood called Nazareth who was racially profiled his whole life and eventually falsely arrested, unjustly prosecuted, and killed by the state of his day. 
That's the Jesus I'm talking about. That Jesus has no problem getting down in the dirt with anybody because that Jesus was quite, quite aware that it was the dirt that produced him. But Jesus knew there was also something inside of him that was greater than any place or space. He was a child of God, and because Jesus was always aware of who he was and whose he was, Jesus could stand next to this woman and make sure that she was not abandoned. So the first question I want you to wrestle with do you notice any women and girls who are abandoned in your immediate circles? And how can you kneel down in the dirt with them to lessen your proximity, your distance away from them? How can you get closer to them in their point of need? Not wait until they get all fixed up, whatever fixed up looks like. But when they're angry, can you not abandon them? When they're hurting, can we not abandon them? When they're struggling, can we not abandon them? But can we stand right next to them and see that there is something precious? It may be buried under all that hurt and pain. Or it may be buried under the accusations of others or the misconceptions of others. But no matter what, I'm going to stand right with them and not abandon Oh, pat yourself on the chest and say, God, don't abandon me. God, don't abandon me. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, don't you abandon me either. Amen. I need you to stay right here. The second thing that I'll lift up that the scripture says, if we are going to stand with our women and girls, we have to do no harm. We have to commit to do no harm. Somebody holler, do no harm. We find in the passage that Moses in the law gives orders to stone persons who are caught up in certain kinds of violations. And they ask Jesus, what do you say? Now, I could spend a whole sermon trying to unpack this, but I only have a few more minutes. I want you to appreciate, my brothers and sisters, that there are some times where the religious laws and mores and the social Laws and mores may give you the opportunity to do harm to others. Sometimes our scriptures, sacred text, or our constitution, secular text, will give you and I all kind of reasons and justifications why harm or violence should be visited upon folk. And then people will join in with that. Well, they had a gun. Well, they, they, their clothes were looking a certain way. Well, you know, they, 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 their orientation is towards this person. Or, or the Bible says this. But isn't it interesting that Jesus, after hearing those scriptures being told to him as, a, as a, a, an excuse why, this woman should be killed. Jesus didn't say, well, there, I guess you just got to, the word, I, well, who am I to argue with the word? Don't much think about that, because that sure enough ain't how some of us act. Whether our sacred or secular texts can be used to justify violence against women and poor people and, and marginalized groups, and some of us will be like, well, you know, the Constitution did say well, the scripture did say, but you know who could, who could always trump what the scripture says? Who Jesus can. Because Jesus is the one who wrote it in the first place. Jesus said, well, I know that's what you thought Moses meant. But you got to remember, I was there with Moses. As a matter of fact, I gave it to Moses. So let me give you, give you a little bit of example. Jesus said, you that are without sin. Throw the first stone. Woo! Them brothers thought they had Jesus in a headlock. Jesus squirmed on out of that thing. And... You better stay close to Jesus and 
commit yourself to doing no harm. And there are many ways you can do harm to folks. It ain't just physical violence. We talked about intimate partner violence. We talked about the police violence. But how many of you know we got systemic violence happening to our women and girls that is worthy of being named and acknowledged? The violence that young women and girls are feeling as they're being pushed out of the schools and into the jails. You and I ought not participate in that kind of violence. The kind of violence that will give a woman a, a partial pay for a full time's work. Hello, somebody. That's violence. That's passive, it's called passive violence. You and I ought not participate in that. That's why I was so glad Sister Moni Law and others helped push through uh, the Berkeley Minimum Wage Act this week in the city of Berkeley where $15 an hour will become the minimum wage. Sometimes you and I have to make sure we're just not checking the box. Well, I'm not hitting on nobody. No, that, 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 you, you better not do that now. That, that is like such the lowest bar. Even though so many of us can't even get that low. Some of us got so much anger and and, and no self-control that we feel like it's okay to put our hands on people. Sister, you you given her description of all the stuff that happened to her, and you just sit, made me sit over there like, I need to follow my daughters everywhere. Because I, I wish somebody would. <laughs> but ain't that something that we can't follow our daughters everywhere? My heart breaks that one out of every three women will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. That means that we have many sisters in this room who carry with them the kind of assault at the hands of someone else, often men. Even in the church, it, you just because you're in church don't mean you all of a sudden are exempt from that kind of evil and vulnerability, human weakness. Being in church don't make your temper go away. Going to therapy does. Dealing with your anger, fear, and pain does. So part of our standing with women and girls means that you and I must resist all the forms of violence as they manifest. Not just the ones that we are, uh, are, are not necessarily struggling with. Hello, somebody that you and I must be like Jesus and, 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 and turn that thing around and start to ask a different kind of question. I know this is what these texts say. I know this is what the Constitution says. I know this is what the Scripture says. But you know what? This is what Jesus is saying. Jesus uses the very same logic to disqualify even the accusers. So one of the questions I want you to wrestle with in this moment, is the violence being perpetrated on women and girls by various forces, is that violence invisible to you? Meaning, do you only focus on a certain kind of violence and, and you, you turning up over that, but you're not willing to lean into all the many forms of violence that come against our women and girls? Are you a complicit agent? Meaning, you're just willing to let the thing go by. Not stand up and do much about it. How can you and I commit to doing no harm? I think that's one of the great, great lessons of Jesus in this passage. He demonstrated with great power and, listen, even with great nonviolence himself. The pathway of doing no harm. And I pray that I can continue to tap into that because there are moments where I look at what's happening and I'd be like, Lord, I only see one way forward. <laughs> Amen. But that's why we all got to stay real close to the God of our salvation. Because I mean, God can always point you and redirect you, even in the middle of your storm, into a place of doing no harm. Because listen, when you do harm to others, you're actually doing harm to yourself. And then the final thing, and we'll spend some time in prayer, 
How can you and I, if we're going to stand with black women and girls, how can we become a source of healing and liberation? Somebody say healing. Someone else say liberation. Jesus catching the, 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 the diabolical machinations of these accusers. Knowing that they're trying to set a trap, mostly for Jesus, but this woman is, is, is so meaningless in their eyes that they're using this woman as a tool to try to entrap Jesus. That's called exploitation, y'all. Huh? That's called exploitation. And what I love about Jesus is that Jesus doesn't just make sure himself ends up free. But in the course of his own liberation, Jesus secures the liberation of this woman. How many of you know our liberation is bound up together? Our healing is bound up together. I can't be free and you be bound. I can't be struggling for healing and just let you stay on the side of the road, bleeding out. My sisters, I can't be well if you're not well. I can't be whole if you're not whole. I can't be in a relationship of health and wellness and balance if my wife is a shell of a human being because of all the hell that she has to catch every single day of her life. I can't be a proud and happy father if my daughters are walking through the world and they're always feeling diminished by the constrictions of a fallen society and world. No. If I am going to be well, if you are going to be well, we got to be well together. <laughs> Jesus affirms her freedom and he says, listen, I know that there were some accusers who were here with you, but look around. There's nobody left. To hold this over your head. There's nobody left. To try to remind you. Of your worst mistake. There's nobody left. Who's able to have the moral high ground. To try to declare. What you should be because. Of your circumstance. And because there's nobody left here to condemn you. Jesus says I'm not going to condemn you neither. Get up. And go. And sin no more. How many of you know that's the word God wants to tell to many of us? It's time for you and I to get up and don't go continuing to be bound in that sin any longer. And always be reminded, my brothers and sisters, that when we talk about sin, we're not just talking about your personal indiscretions. Because when we talk about sin, we appreciate and we know that sin is manifest in many ways in the world. That there is the sin beyond us. Simon Chan, a, a wonderful Asian theologian, says it so powerfully. That there's the sin beyond us. That's the devil and, and the manifestation of real evil in the world. Somebody say sin beyond us. There's the sin around us. And that's the sin that is manifested through racism and systemic exclusion and patriarchy. The kind of systems that bind us and, and grind us into dust. Injustice. That is the sin that is around us. Somebody say sin around us. And then there's the sin within us. That is the sin that is about our inability to follow the ways of God without stepping outside the boundaries of who God and what God says we ought to do. Somebody say the sin within us. But I'm so glad that no matter what kind of sin that we're talking about, Jesus knows how to send us forward in a way where that sin will not overdetermine our lives. And I'm here to tell you today that it's time for the people of God who are willing to stand up with our women and girls and with oppressed peoples and poor people, even with their own self. It's time for us to stand up and say, I will sin no more. I will not be complicit in the kind of sin that's happening around me. I will not be complicit with the kind of sin that is happening beyond me. I will not be complicit. 
complicit in the sin that is struggling inside of me. But if God has set me free, and if God has blew into my mind and my soul and my body his breath of life, then I can stand up and be who God has called me to be. Somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I'm so glad that the text reminds us uh, in Ephesians chapter number six uh, to be strong in the Lord uh, and in the power of his might uh, that we ought to put on the whole armor of God uh, so that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, uh, but against rulers and authorities uh, against the spiritual wickedness in high places uh, against the forces of darkness uh, in the world Uh, so he says therefore my beloved uh, take up the whole armor of God uh, so you may be able to stand on that evil day Uh, do I have anybody that's willing to stand on that evil day Uh, and having done everything you can uh, it's time for you to stand Uh, somebody holler stand Uh, stand therefore Uh, put on the belt of truth around your waist Uh, somebody say stand put on the breastplate of righteousness Uh, somebody say stand Put on the shoes uh, that will help you proclaim the gospel of peace. Uh, Somebody say stand. Uh, And with all of these things, uh, you ought to take the shield of faith. uh, That can help you quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Uh, Somebody holler stand. uh, And take with you the helmet of salvation. uh, So we can guard your mind. Uh, because how many of you know if you keep your mind in Jesus uh, he'll give you perfect peace to keep you in the middle of your storm Uh, somebody holler stand uh, and take the sword of the spirit uh, that Holy Ghost that lives on the inside of you Uh, some of us need to cultivate a little bit more of the spirit uh, If I'm going to stand with black women and girls, uh, if I'm going to stand with the oppressed, uh, if I'm going to stand with the poor, uh, with the marginalized, uh, with the invisible uh, and the erased, uh, I'm going to need the Spirit of God uh, living on the inside of me. Uh, I'm going to need the power of God uh, that will give me the strength I need. uh, Give you the courage you need. Give you the power you need. I'm going to need the word that will remind me what did God say. God said I will never leave you nor forsake you. What did God say? He said no they come up against you. One way. God said they'll flee before you. Seven ways. God said they're going to come at you. But the word says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will lift up the standard against them. You got some help. You got some power. You got some victory. You just got to stand. 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 Don't get tired. Don't go in the towel. Don't lose heart. But stand. 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 God's going to give you the victory. Stand. God's going to defeat patriarchy. Stand. God's going to defeat sexism. Stand. You shall. Overcome, shout hallelujah.